Arts, let's get started. It's 1030. If you would take your seats. Well, let's go because we're not, we're keeping our rest of the It's my great privilege to introduce our next speaker and our speaker who's going to the I Lead You cohorts across this great nation of ours. Uh, this is John Emerson who will be our next speaker. He is a communications professional from Brooklyn. Thank you very much. Let's have a round of applause for John. Thank you. Hello, Springfield. Hello. hello. And to all my friends on the internet, hello world. Uh, I am a creative director and technologist from Brooklyn. Uh, I'm not a librarian, but I have spent a lot of time in libraries over the last few years. My daughter is four and uh, loves stories. We have to tell her every night that dinner is not the time for stories and books. Um, we love visiting Miss Rakisha at our local branch. and. Uh, she wanted to be Max from Where the Wild Things Are for the last two Halloweens. She's four, so that's half. And the first one probably doesn't count. Uh, so I have worked with nonprofits and media companies for the last 17 years on their communications. I built a lot of websites, some print design, some maps, some motion graphics, and a range of media. Uh, and I, I write a little bit about design uh, and advocacy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I know and how give you some tips for how you can uh, promote your projects. So who here loves advertising? Ha well, hands. You love when, when you know, you love when the sh your shows are interrupted, you know, pop-up windows, animated, animated banners with sound when you're trying to read the news. Uh, so I generally find these things annoying and intrusive, um, but every now and then, every once in a while, there's, a, there's you see an image, a special ad that makes you laugh, or something that's actually useful and relevant. Uh, in the nonprofit world, we prefer to call it outreach, and that's what we're doing. We're not trying to sell something. We're not trying to pry your hard-earned cash uh, out of your pocket. We're trying to provide you with a service. Because you're, you're, you have a, a wonderful gift. You're going to help people solve their problems. But to do that, you have to find them, and you have to let them know what you have. Um, but more importantly, you have, it has to stick. You have to capture their imagination. So, so how do we do this? Uh, first, I'm going to introduce my father. This is uh, George. He's retired. He lives in Miami, and you know, we love each other very much. We talk on the phone now and then. And he sends me a lot of email, but he never actually writes. So, so what is he sending? <laughs> He's sending me jokes and articles and links and recipes and tips. Did I mention jokes? Um, <laughs> he's sharing things that he's found on the internet or that friends have sent to him. And this is what we do with, with people that we love and 
Um, this is not necessarily a reflection of his relationship with me as much as his re re relationship with me filtered through the technology. The internet is this giant sharing machine, this 24-7 worldwide sharing machine. How many of you have posted a picture to Facebook or a link? Yeah, a lot of us, we, we share things all the time. Things that are interesting, things that move us, things that provoke us. And so why do we do this? Why do we share these things? A lot of it has to do with things that touch our, our, our emotions. Things that are funny, things that are outrageous, things that uh, give us a twinge of nostalgia, things that are cute. Humor is a, a very powerful tactic and we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, these are banners uh, from a website called BuzzFeed, buzzfeed.com, which tracks viral media, things that people are sharing. Uh, and you can see kind of the range of emotions and ideas that that they're, they're using. You, for, for the images that they share, you can click on these buttons to indicate your feelings about it. And they've also sorted, uh, you can view all of the items uh, sorted by win or LOL. Um, and actually I don't recommend visiting, uh, especially when you're working on your presentation because you can easily lose an hour or two. <laughs> the, the image, it's very compelling stuff. Um, so, so I'm gonna show you an example of a campaign that uses sharing uh, very effectively and that the campaign, the results of it, the story of the campaign itself was also shared. So do, have you all, do you all know the story about the library in Troy? Yeah. Yes, okay. Some, some of you don't, so. The library in Troy was facing budget cuts as many libraries are and uh, they were, uh, put, were able to propose a tax to the local ballot and there are certain, uh, certain uh, people among us that are uh, that hate taxes. Nobody loved, nobody likes a tax, but the the people were outraged. Writing letters to the editor, posting signs uh, on street corners. They made a very big deal about this tax. We hate taxes. Small government, no taxes, and it really drowned out um, uh, the the conversation. So, what did the library do? They proposed a book burning party. So the, they produced some signs of their own, and they were worked with an ad agency to set up this campaign. And a lot of people actually uh, believe that, that this was a sincere proposal because this was taking place uh, within the, the conversation of taxes, taxes, taxes. So they set up a Facebook page, they set up a Twitter page. Um, and some people were in on the joke, but other people were not. Uh, and the beauty of this campaign is that both of those parties were sharing it with their friends. And this actually uh, received quite a bit of coverage in the media as well. So they took out ads in the local paper. <laughs> they booked a band for the book burning party. And as things reached a fever pitch, uh, right just when they had taken this modest proposal to its logical extreme, then came the big reveal. A vote against the library is like a vote to burn books. And this people had overwhelming, overwhelming emotional response to this. They had completely changed the conversation using humor, uh, using cheekiness. Uh, so the, the vote actually passed by an overwhelming margin. The library was saved uh, and then some. And so it's interesting, to, to the tactics of this campaign is actually a pretty low tech campaign. They did, there was no custom programming involved. They used Facebook, they used Twitter. Um, they paid for classified ads, it's not too much. But it was very, very effective. And so I propose to you, your mission is not just to spread the word but to get people to take notice. Now it's very different if, if, if I'm trying to Google around and see, oh, what time does my local branch open on Sunday? I don't want to hear the story. I just want the number, yes or no. Um, but when you're reaching out, when you're trying to spread the word, you want to really move people and stir people and get them to share it. So what can you do to encourage people to spread the word for you? So word of mouth, it's extraordinarily powerful. 
It's also cheaper. Uh, word of mouth influences museum goers 13 times more than conventional advertising. And people don't go to museums to see the latest exhibit. They go to see it with someone they care about. And, and this, this campaign for, for the Met uh, Museum, little museum in my hometown, uh, they, the ad campaign using Flickr photos taken by patrons at the museum. This is a, uh, someone took a picture, these are her parents in the photo. And very, very, very effective, very emotional, very fun. And these were all over buses and, and billboards for a while. And it, it pictures the museum as a fun kind of collaborative social space. Um, also, it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit counterintuitive and most museums are not allowed to take photos. So word of mouth is persuasive and th there's lots of hard data from political campaigns that show that you know, just good old fashioned door knocking, shoe leather, friends and family influence voters uh, more than TV ads. Even those, those annoying lawn signs that you see everywhere, everyone makes fun of those but they're, they're, they're persuasive. And people are influenced by what other people are doing. We actually heard from Brian uh, just uh, in the previous session, that when teens uh, are impressed by something, they tell their friends. But you can't actually approach a teen and say, hey, we're offering this service. You have to kind of entice them, bring them in. Uh, and even, even law firms, I was pitching a, a design project to a law firm, and you can imagine lawyers being you know, sort of hard-hitting, fact-focused, fact uh, hard-nosed bunch. But one of the first questions that one of the partners asked was, what are other law firms doing? So we know ideas spread, but uh, emotions spread as well. This was a report about a study uh, out of Harvard, so you know it's good, that shows that happiness is contagious. That's a good gig, right? Be the happiness researcher at Harvard. Um, and unhappiness is as well, but not as much as happiness. So how do we crack this? How do we start a word of mouth campaign? This is a, a design principle from Jer Thorpe, who's a creative technologist for the New York Times. And he does these wonderful, uh, immersive, interactive displays. So he, it's called the, the ooh-ah principle. You want to catch their attention with surprise and delight, and then move them to understanding. So you start with the ooh and bring them to the ah. And we love surprises. We love things that are new and novel. You've probably heard people use the word innovative in the last few days. So here's an advocacy campaign that, uh, again, relatively low tech, but that uses surprise, I think, in a very nice way. This was uh, an installation in Indonesia in front of the presidential palace uh, in, in 2006 to, uh, to kind of put, there were, there were just terrible, terrible mudslides uh, in East Java four years prior, and many people were still without homes, uh, still suffering, so the Greenpeace Indonesia worked with an ad agency to put this installation together and to really put it back in the news. Uh, and it was a temporary installation. You can see bits of furniture, and bicycle, a rickshaw, signage kind of uh, cut off to look as if they're sort of trapped in the mud. A Little bit of a metaphor here in front of the palace. And it probably didn't last very long, um, but the media was there, it was captured in photos, it was reproduced very widely on Twitter, and it generated, it, it put this story back onto the front pages. Um, you probably didn't even need a new bicycle for this, just take an old one, card law. But uses surprise, taking something familiar and putting it into an unfamiliar situation. Maybe you've seen these. These are uh, trucks decked out for the uh, Johnson County Library in Kansas City. This is Captain Ahab's Fine Seafood, Kafka's Pest Control. <laughs> right, so cute, funny, cheeky. Benjamin Button's Diaper Service. <laughs> Dr. Jekyll's Pharmacy. You know, and they probably, they already had the trucks. It doesn't cost too much money to print up some vinyl siding. But it's unexpected, and it makes people, oh, have you seen this? These were passed widely around on Flickr. 
and uh, and there was a press release as well. These aren't just it's not just a matter of putting it out there and waiting for people to document it. So stories. One of the other things that, some of the other things that, uh, that move us are stories. We've been telling each other stories for thousands of years. Stories make up our culture. Um, every culture of the world has a storytelling tradition. We've been telling each other stories around caves and campfires, barbecues and the dinner table. Um, our, the family histories that we pass on to our children are stories. We interpret the world through stories about spirit or physical forces. I, of course, I don't need to lecture librarians about the importance of stories. Uh, but stories, uh, if you want to remember something, you use a mnemonic device, this little story, something silly, something absurd. And uh, my favorite data point about the impact of stories is, comes from Brazil. A study of population trends since 1971 found a, a, a strong correlation between the spread of the reach of the Globo TV channel and the divorce rate. So images of, uh, of uh, modern lifestyles, uh, portrayals of emancipated women's roles, critiquing traditional values were associated with a rise of separations and a decline in uh, birth rate. And this is, I had a hard time finding an image uh, to illustrate the point of divorce, but I don't think that's his wife. So these are some elements of story. We don't have to necessarily use all of these uh, in our campaigns. I'm going to talk a little bit about character in a minute. Uh, but just adding, adding a layer of metaphor to your message, or in this, to be more specific, a simile in this particular case. It says, cutting libraries in a recession is like cutting hospitals in a plague. It really animates it. I think it, it, it adds, a, it gives a gravity to, to the message that, that simply stating the facts and figures wouldn't. The story is also, it, it helps to make things personal. So here's a, here's a pop quiz. Can you associate the figures on the left with the issues on the right? Hard to do. Now, how about the names of the figures here with the Yushas on the right? It helps to have the narrative. It helps to have a character. We know these stories, not just the facts and figures. And now, if I talk about, uh, again, in the abstract, if I say, oh, a quarter of a million pets uh, every year are affected by, by hoarding, it's kind of hard to visualize a quarter of a million pets. I can't, you know, how many football stadiums is that? But if I, talk, if I tell you the story of one particular kit, a little cat named Timmy who was on the streets, he was stuck, he was taken home, here's a photo of him or her, you start to have more empathy. People, people uh, you can empathize more with, with one person, ironically, than you can with very large numbers at the same time. And that's just the way our brains work. We're not used to traveling in tribes of, of quarters of a million. So here's another, here's a fantastic little redesign. This is the before picture that uses some of these principles, uses story, uses, uh, uses character. This is the 2001 long range transportation plan for Los Angeles County. Uh, you know, nice picture of LA, maybe sunset or sunrise, driving off into the future. This is the interior. It's not terrible. I've seen worse, believe me. And now here's the redesign. It takes it away from the data, away from the orientation of the organization itself, focuses on the user, focuses on the patron, focuses on, on the message, the why, not just the what. focuses on the reasons that we have public transportation. I want a better quality of life. This is not just about budget figures. You can see the, the bus is in the background, as it should be. 
And again, so large photos, photos of people, bright colors, and focus, I want statements, focuses on the target audience. So make it visual. There's a well-documented physiological effect called the picture, super, the picture superiority effect that, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a designer, a little biased, um, but shows if you hear something in words, three days later you'll remember maybe 10% of it, give or take. But if you hear something in words and pictures, you remember much more. And this is some of the science, uh, some of the, the, the cognitive science behind logos. We want to build associations around a particular icon or image. A lot of these things that I'm talking about, they're, they're brain hacks. And I'm very much not a biological determinist, but these things are, there's lots of data around these. So images also help focus and give our, our messages force. And here's uh, another example. So a picture of a crowd. This could be a, could be a park on a Sunday after a long winter. Could be a school. But you add, add, a, add some imagery, and now you have a movement. You don't want to mess with these folks. And, or the, or their budget. <laughs> so people love sharing images. You post them to Flickr, Pinterest, Tumblr, Facebook, email. Um, but the old media, TV, newspapers, they love images too. It's less, less fewer words to write, uh, fewer minutes of air time. If you can just flash an image that gets the message across quickly, TV loves that. So the first, uh, before we do anything in Webland, when we're building a website, we want to ask, who's our customer? Who's our target audience? Who are we trying to reach? This is the, the question from which everything flows. And this is uh, from where our outreach uh, flows. It's, it's very tempting to start with, oh, we have this cool technology. We're going to build a startup around it. Don't. We want to say, who are the customers? And once you know who they are, then you know where they are. And you, you're, you're already know this because you've been dealing with your, uh, your, your community reps. So where are they? Are they in particular neighborhoods? Are they in particular uh, organizations? Are they on, on using mobile phones? Are they using desktop computers? And once you start to have a picture, then you can start to plug into existing networks including old media, sending out a press release. It's just one of many networks nowadays. It used to be the network, but now there are very many channels. So you start to break it down. This is a, a campaign from London called Get London Reading, where they put uh, quotes from famous literary works into the street where the people were. And a lot of the quotes had to do with the specific geographic locations. This one about Brick Lane, There's one about Mill Lane and cardboard boxes in the street. Again, very low tech. They probably already had the boxes. <laughs> but unexpected, it add, adding a little, a little moment of surprise, a little moment of delight to that, that daily grind, to that daily commute. So who, you know who they are. You know where they are. And this, this speaks to what uh, David was saying yesterday morning. What do they care about? What do they want? So it's not just enough to send out an invitation and assume that they'll come. You want to catch their attention, make an impression, and give them a reason to show up. And as I was talking with Gwen uh, a few days ago, 
ultimately it comes down to a question of happiness. You have the solutions to their problems, and this is the, the greatest gift you can give. And once you reach people, they want to share it with their friends. You want to make them say, have you seen this? So thank you. And you can, you can download this uh, on the web. <laughs> so Andy's saying that they did a, for the people on the internet who couldn't hear, uh, they did a Before I Die installation, and one of the first things that went up was, Before I Die, I want to meet Cher. Anyone in the room? Oh. So the, there are two parts to the one was looking at outputs versus outcomes. Outputs meaning more of the the specific products, and outcomes meaning I guess sort of how they're used, how they're how they impact, how they impact people's lives, and how to track that. The qualitative stuff is hard hard to track. I mean, that's people they have focus groups, they have surveys. Um, you can you can look at. Uh, depending on your data, if you're doing an online service, like one of the groups here is you can look at usage stats. That's pretty easy. Um, you can look at circulation numbers, number you know, patron traffic. Um, but in terms of how people are taking this into their lives, that's that's harder. That's harder to track. Look at the the number of retweets. We have a comment. Excellent program. We clap for you in Iowa. Thank you, Iowa. So the, the question is, is it more effective to have a, a central marketing person or department or for each person in an organization to, to use this? I think, you, I think you need a little of both. I mean, if it's, it's hard to bring design thinking into an organization that is sort of institutionally hasn't embraced it. So you need, that needs to be kind of part of the DNA, part of the thinking. Um, People need to res take it seriously and respect it. Uh, that said, it's, it's also nice to have someone who has an eye for type and color, or uh, you know, who can you can bounce off ideas off of someone to help actually shepherd things through production. Um, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the examples I showed were designed by outside ad agencies, um, very often pro bono. So that's always. A nice way, you know, if, if if you come to an ad agency and say we have, or or a designer and say I have this much money for printing, what do you got? You know, designers love a good cause, especially if it's going to be printed out in the world. Um, I know I love making beautiful print work after spending so much time in Weblane. Yes. Can you tell us about a, a typical project you might work on if you're, if you're a regular 
oh boy, a typical project that I would work on in my regular life. I have such a range of projects, it's hard to, to say what's typical. I'm doing a lot of responsive web redesigns now. Um, other things, I do a bit of uh, cartography, print maps, um, mostly for, for Human Rights Watch these days. Right. I feel like it's still part of our mission, and I don't know, I just feel like we get so stuck on that, that it's like, well, it's not part of our mission. Right, right, yeah. So the question is, how do you get people talking who are not in your immediate uh, geographical area? How do you reach out across the country, and, and, and should you? Um, yeah, no, I think that, so the question of, of how is is working with, with different demographics is, is an interesting challenge because you have so many different age ranges and so many different um, relationships to the technology. Um, but things like humor tend to cut across fairly easily. Um, but not everyone's going to respond to the kitten photos. It's, you know, so you need to have multiple strategies. Um, and, and should you? I mean, that's, I think, yeah. But, but that's, that's a matter of, uh, your organization's priorities. I mean, I think the more, uh, I, I, for instance, I, I discovered this list of the dial a story numbers that they're just, it's a very old technology. Um, and now with cell phones, I can make calls to any of those for, for the same price. So I'm sitting there with my daughter, I'm calling a local library in Delaware. She doesn't know, they don't care. It's, I'm not, as long as I'm not preventing another patron from ac accessing it. Um, yeah, no, I think I think it's, it's an exciting time to to really branch out. Um, we have a couple questions from Twitter or comments. Don't send the invitation and assume they'll come. Catch their attention, make an impression, give them a reason to show up. I agree. Yeah. And maybe instead of save the kitten, try save this kitten. Do you all want to talk uh, about successful or thoughts, I thoughts, ideas, and so forth about um, advertising, publicity, initiatives at your own institutions, maybe have a, a mini dialogue? Do you have any ideas? Do you have any things you want to share with somebody who actually uh, does this for a living? Well, you do have a question from the Twitter account. Too. Yes. <laughs> so uh, would I talk about nonprofits and advertising and the notion of marketing uh, being a waste of money? Uh, well, it's, it, it, every, every nonprofit is different, is kind of the lawyerly answer. Um, but uh, it, you know, and it, it depends on it, the mission of that particular nonprofit, the, the community that it's serving, the donor community is reaching out to. Uh, we're not necessarily talking about producing, you know, fancy PSAs. Um, although, you know, one of my former colleagues from, uh, from Amnesty International, uh, Helen, uh, was was an amazing genius about getting all kinds of celebrity uh, contributions for free for the, for the good cause. So, is that a waste of money? I don't I don't think so. Um, but uh, groups like to see that their donations. Uh, sorry, uh, donors like to see that, that their donations are, are going to program work and not to fundraising. Um, so there's a bit of a tension there. You can't, it's hard to do fundraising without the marketing. Um, but you, you strike a balance. Sure. Sure, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so actually the, the, the Los Angeles Metro is, is, is an amazing case study, um, really take, re, reframing it, uh, not just with the logo, but with their messaging, the way their, their colors, they, they, they painted all of the buses different colors, very bright colors. Um, and they put sort of cheeky, uh, they, they, they changed their tone. It wasn't just, you know, we're starting an express line, on, um, but it was, you know, hey, you look great today. You know, thanks for riding the Metro. Um, the, it, it was much more personal, much more engaging, uh, and it became less of a county bureaucracy um, and more of something kind of fun. Yes. Right. Well, I, I think the, the the question is how do we bring more patrons into the library that connected to the, the museum, a popular museum, um, and I think the, the Civil War example is a good one because you're really you're personalizing it, you're focusing on what what can the library do for you, uh, how do you how can how can you find your own story within the library. So I think other. Uh, other things along those lines would be interesting. Uh, have people coming in, uh, making you know, we've been talking about the maker spaces and making turning the library into a space for for content creation, um, and and you can use that, use those stories again to that, that's great content to advertise. If people are telling their own stories, with their permission, of course, you can then uh, project those uh, in outside in the streets or um, you know, invite the media, you know, get a projector on the facade of the building. So you, you're, you're not, just a, not just a space for this, but you, you have a kind of a big channel. One of the projects I worked on was, was for VH1. It was called Acceptable TV. And each, every two weeks, uh, people would send in little YouTube videos that they had created and were, they were voted up or down. And at the end of the two weeks, the, the top voted ones were curated and, and broadcast on, on, on VH1 in a half hour show. And so they were, they were using, it was all user generated content, but they were using their big channel uh, to really highlight that. And I think that libraries can take that approach as well. Right, common design mistakes. I think uh, it's too much text. This is all about the text. Um, now, text has a place. I love text. Uh, I'm not. I'm not against the text. Uh, but when you're when you're doing your outreach, we need to think about beyond the text. Think visually. Not just enough to to hand out flyers. I mean, it, it, again, it depends on context. If you're uh, you need to have a Facebook page. You need to have your website in order so people can find what they're looking for. But then, if you're if you're spreading out, spreading the word on a poster, one design principle is that everything you have on the poster competes with everything else. 
You want to simplify, 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 boil it down to the essence. What, what's the minimum you can show uh, to, get the, to get the message across? Uh, I, I use them interchangeably. Um, could you say a little more about, like, say you're launching a new web project product? We know, I mean, you said, you mentioned, you know, know your customers, know your users. Can you say a little more about the process of like, what needs to be thought about and before? So what needs to be thought about before you launch a new web product? Um, so, so, first of all, you, you ask your customer, you sort of, you can do a focus group, you can do what they call persona exercise where you start to break down um, who are, what are sort of typical users or patrons that you're trying to reach. Uh, and then start to, start to target your messages based on that. Um, it's always fun to see something physical in the world relating back to a web project, whether it's, Stickers, posters, something in the street, um, stencils, you know, the kids, they love the stencils. Um, you know, little product boxes for website cereal or, you know, something unexpected, something um, that you can send out uh, and catch people's attention um, beyond just the t-shirts and that sort of thing. Um, but also, I mean, make sure the website itself is clear and you know, it says it says what it does, does what it says. Um, you can hold a usability session, get a room full of people with a couple of pizzas, set them up in front of the computer, make sure, you know, watch how they use the site, get their impressions, um, get, uh, you get great feedback that way. You should, I recommend everyone do this before launching uh, a website. Anyone else? Anyone on Twitter? Okay. Um, from Colorado, it says, uh, really too much text, simplify. Yeah. Uh, too much text, what's the minimum you can show to express your message in text? Well, you know, my slides tend to have one word. So I think that that would be a good that would be a good minimum. Hard to go below that. Although you know you could, could you could do it with images. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Hey everybody. Um, take some time. Uh, we're going to launch, meet with your groups, talk with your groups. We'll see you back for the next round of sessions at 12.15. Er, thank you, 12.15. <laughs>